The information in this podcast is current on the day of recording. It is general advice only and does not take your personal situation into account. It may not be suitable for you. Good morning, everybody. My name is John Addis. I am founder and editor of Intelligent Investor. And this morning I have with me here our newest addition to the team, Raymond Jang. How are you doing, Raymond? Yeah, great, John. Um, really excited to be on the podcast and to be, um, you know, seeing the members. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is the idea. Um, we should tell the members that we are in the midst of reporting season right now. Everybody's working pretty hard. We also went to uh, a brewery for a field trip on Monday, and uh, maybe some people are recovering from that. But uh, either way, there's lots of stuff going on. So I thought this would be a good opportunity Raymond, just to introduce you to the membership, you're our newest team member. Um, you're our junior analyst. We've been working quite closely together on um, your recent reviews. So it will be nice to start to introduce you to the members and a bit about your background. So let's let's kick off with your education and what you did at uni and maybe where you went, where you went after you left uni. Let's start there. Yeah, sure. Um, I followed a pretty traditional pathway. Um, when I grew up, I was brought up with parents who were quite focused on um, academics. So mm -hmm. went to a lot of Turing when I grew up. Um, and they really wanted me to follow that pathway to work at a corporate. Um, mm -hmm. I saw a lot of the ads for the chartered accounting program that that looked enticing, mainly because I've never You're heard right. it described like that before, <laughs> Raymond. Enticing. That's um, the chart accounting. Yeah, probably probably relative to what my parents were doing. So they mm. both worked uh, pretty blue collar jobs. Yeah. Um, so they came to Australia, so they didn't really have much opportunities to um, you know, really study. And mm -hmm. yeah, my parents pushed me hard. Um so I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I grew up, but um, because financially um, we weren't in the best shape, yeah. um, I think I've grown up with the mindset of being very conservative and mm -hmm. trying to go with the uh, safe option of accounting. Um, mm -hmm. I did... that's, not, that's not a bad start for a value investor. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't have that as my main focus. Um, but just really wanted to get a good start into a stable job, stable career. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's funny because my parents were, um, uh, really never into investing. They always treated as some form of gambling. It was, yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, which it is, which it is for some people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yes, decided to, you know, go, and study commerce at UNSW. Mm -hmm. um, I was always interested in businesses growing up. Why was that, do you think? Um, I was also quite fascinated by scandals, corporate scandals. Really? Um, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of businesses, just um, trying to understand how a business works, um, the people who run it, um, and just reading uh, the newspaper that was kind of like that section and the sports section was probably yeah. the, the key sections. That so, so you were reading the business section in the media. At what age did you get into that? Oh, I was probably maybe 10, 10 11 really? years old. Wow. Um, just <clears throat> found, oh, I read the sports first and then, then made my way into the mm -hmm. business section. But it was kind of interesting to me. Um, and... Yeah, I thought accounting would be um, a good option. Okay, so you so you went to uni in New South Wales to study accounting. Uh, you did that for three years, I presume. Yeah, it was a traditional accounting and finance major. Okay. Um, just and, and where did you go after that? What were your ambitions after that? <clears throat> yeah, so I did an internship at KPMG. So spent um, my summer doing auditing. Um, mainly because no better I way to spend a summer than orders him, Raymond. <laughs> I actually had this um this preconception that it would be you know trying to 
uncover fraud. Um, when, and, and you found out it was quite the opposite. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was all about sticking to materiality thresholds and doing a, you know, doing the job for the client. Um, yeah. But even my internship, it was re really uh, menial tasks and repetitive tasks and mm -hmm. really just doing a lot of administrative stuff. But just observing what the managers were doing, um, it just really didn't get me excited. So I, I tried to find something else that was much more intriguing. Yeah. So were you investing at this point? You hadn't started looking at stocks or had you started investing by this point? No, no. Um, the only exposure I had to the share market was the, I think the ASX share trading game uh, back in high school. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, even then it wasn't, it didn't really interest me ma mainly because my parents and relatives were just like, Oh, stay away from it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, so I came across insolvency, um, forensic accounting, those areas of accounting really mm -hmm. interested in me. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, just tried to apply for graduate programs and landed a job at William Buck, um, in their corporate recovery team. Right. Okay. And how was that? Did you have any yeah. interesting corporate failures to work on? Yeah, it was, it was super interesting, um, uh, for, uh, for someone who didn't really know much about business, um, didn't really realize how many dodgy operators are there, um, mm -hmm. out there. Um, let's not mention any names at this point, Raymond. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, <laughs> I was going to say, I, I've been sued enough in one lifetime, but let's not do it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think my first insolvency appointment was actually a Domino's franchise um, mm -hmm. out in, I think, in the inner west, out in Concord. So what happened um, there then? Yeah, that was where the franchise owed a big sum of money to the ATO. Um, mm -hmm. So for those who aren't familiar with the insolvency process, if the ATO is owed a lot of money, they can go to the court and court issues in order for the company to um, have it wound up. Mm -hmm. And by that time, because once you issue an order, um, the director's already aware that you know, they're in, in trouble. So mm -hmm. by the time you actually um, arrive at the premises with the, the formal order, yeah. um, it's already too late by then. And most yeah. directors kind of just um, take the money and run. <laughs> so what, they resigned or they've... Um, in that circumstance, they took assets out of the business before it was it in that, solvent? yeah, there were a lot of transactions, um, that had been processed prior to in the lead up to the liquidation. Um, but in terms of the operations of the business, um, it was still operating. Um, but when we turned up, there were two employees, um, director wasn't there, um, we couldn't contact the director, uh, but eventually over time. Um, he explained the situation and just he just couldn't manage the tax affairs right okay well that, that's an interesting start to look at businesses that fail rather than businesses that succeed which i think is where most people start you know you you're attracted to something that succeeds and you see a share price double or triple or more hmm. and that often brings people in so let's move on to your first stock at what what point did you think, okay, I'm going to commit some capital to an opportunity. What got you to that point? And what, what did you end up buying? Hmm. So it was just before COVID. So I was working at ASIC at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was very um, lost in terms of what I wanted to do, what, what my passion was. Mm -hmm. And I came across investing, started reading about it, uh, listened to podcasts. and um, I think I reached out to actually Luke Winchester, you might mm -hmm. be familiar with. Yeah, yeah. He um he suggested that, you know, if you if you really want to um understand whether or not you're truly passionate about investing, um just just research and set up your own blog. So I actually set up my own blog and the first company I researched was Shaver Shop. Okay. Right. And 
it hit all the metrics because I read Pat Dorsey's book, um, five um, tips for successful stock investing, pretty mm-hmm. uh, generic title, but it it had a structure to it. Um, and I was um, ticking off the checklist and Shaver Shop hit all the, the right metrics. Right. And yeah, that was my first company, but I actually ended up not investing in it. Um, Why was that? Because the pandemic hit and then everything was falling. Yeah. So I figured it's probably best to wait a bit. Um, but and over how, time, I. How did they go during COVID? Because I can imagine you can't go to the hairdressers. You couldn't. As, as as members might be able to tell, I actually one of the legacies of the pandemic for me is I've started cutting my own hair really, really badly. Um, <laughs> did did shave a shop? Short, I think. <laughs> <laughs> did shave a shop um, experience a bit of a boom, like so many other retailers, you know, through their online store, or did people just do people really want to go into the store to choose the products that they want? Yeah. That they were massive beneficiaries of yeah. um, the pandemic because everyone ended up just getting their hair cut um, mm. at home. And they shaved at home. Um, and even the women's products, um, people were, I think, I think I heard a story where L'Oreal actually delivered a lot of their products straight, um, straight home. And people were, you know, um, doing their hair, doing their makeup yeah. um, at home. So yeah. they, they, I think they went from 30 cents to like more than a dollar um, after, wow. oh, similar to a lot of, well, most of the stocks yeah. in the share market. Yeah. Um, it, it's an interesting thing. I think we might look back on that period um, with a sense of amazement. And that was something that occurred to me when we were at the brewery on Monday. So we, we do occasional field trips just to, see businesses live, so to speak. Um, the fact that this was a brewery was a big attraction for everybody. Um, and we won't say which one it was, but uh, the, the the people running it, just highly energetic, enthused characters, just absolutely love beer and the process of making beer and had opened up just before the pandemic and in a, in a bar in Katumba and had to shut down because everything was shut down and they had some cans and they decided to try and sell them on Instagram and they sold out within 24 hours. And then they did a whole week's worth of batch brewing and they sold out within 24 hours and they went from zero to incredible volume very, very quickly. And what happened because other breweries were closing down because all the pubs were shut. They also managed to get this huge new brewing equipment that had been installed, wasn't really being used, very cheaply, high quality German equipment that allowed them to increase production massively. And the pandemic just had this incredible effect where not only did demand massively increase, but they managed to get the equipment to increase supply also at the same time. And that's just a really, really unusual set of circumstances um, that we saw in that business it sounded as though Shaver Shop only had one half of that effect. You know, like you can't, mm. did they have any problems getting hold of shavers? They were selling that many. Was supply constrained in that way? Um, I can't remember. Um, mm. But yeah, it, was, it wasn't definitely um, similar circumstances to the brewing company where they were able to capitalize on really depressed prices for plant and equipment. Yeah. Um, but I think, Lavesa was one of the big beneficiaries with True. Uh, a similar situation. True, yeah. 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 Okay, so you didn't buy any stock in Shaver Shop, which you might have been kicking yourself over. What was what was the first company that you, you purchased? It was actually a little company called Rectifier Technologies mm-hmm. uh, Limited, which is actually ironically my biggest position to date, even though I've moved away from the micro cap scene to um, the large cap scene. And when I talk about micro caps, it's probably below 200 mil uh, okay. market yeah, cap. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, before we tell members uh, about Rectify, let's just take a quick break. If you like the sound of our investing approach and aren't yet a member, visit intelligentinvestor.com.au to take us on a free 15-day test drive. Get immediate access 
to all of our current buy recommendations, model portfolios and engaging educational research tailor-made for people that want to manage their own money. That's intelligentinvestor.com.au for a free 15-day trial. No credit card required. Welcome back, everybody. We're here with Raymond Jang, who is talking about his first stock purchase, which was a micro cap called Rectify, currently still his position, uh, biggest position. What did you like about Rectify, Raymond? I think it was the electrical vehicle uh, industry tailwind. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of talk about that. Um, but it also hit um, all the right metrics uh, when I did my filtering. It was free cash flow positive. Had a, so what what kind of business were they in? Um, so they, they do? so they built power modules that go into um, the charges for electric vehicles. So there's a company called Tritium that builds the um, the charges that are being um, built across Australia and across Europe, and they need power inverters. So essentially. Um, converting the energy from negative to positive and yeah. it's a mission critical part of the actual charger um but they've historically been in the space of um building equipment for um the infrastructure space especially ch- charging yeah um so i think that just the massive tailwind uh, really interested mm-hmm. me okay and how's the business gone since you purchased it yeah, it's done quite well. I did purchase the stock um, during the pandemic, so mm-hmm. um, it was quite fortuitous. Okay, so it sounds as though, so, so what sort of kind of approach did you bring to that situation then in terms of your investing mentality? You said there was a tailwind behind it, but what, what else was it about the business that you liked? What I'm really asking is whether at this point were you were you would you have considered yourself to be a value investor, or were you doing something you now see as a bit different to that? Um, having listened to a lot of the podcast and reading a lot of books, um, everyone talks about um, finding high quality businesses, but at that point in time, I just hadn't come across enough businesses to even work out what. A high quality business represents mm-hmm. so at that time management were very um they kept them themselves they're quite reserved conservative um and that's the kind of management team i liked yeah um and they seemed to operate in a niche where there were very few competitors um especially in australia mm-hmm. um can i just can I just stop you there? Because I wanted to just sort of draw a parallel with your family background and the mentality you 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 have whilst talking about this situation. Generally, when we bring a new analyst on, they've tried a lot of different approaches before they arrive at value investing. So they might have a lot of tried charting, for example, technical analysis. There are people who are momentum investing, which I thought initially when you spoke about this business, I thought, oh, maybe it's just jumping on this trend. Mm. But it sounds as though you'd already arrived at this kind of a, a value-based kind of thinking, not just from the books that you've read, but also maybe from your family background where it's quite conservative and risk averse. And that maybe steered you in the direction of value investing almost without you knowing it. Would that be, mm. is that on the money or is that off the mark? I think you're probably right. I haven't really given it too much thought, but when you frame it like that and reflecting on the types of businesses that I do prefer to look at, mm. it probably reflects my um, my perception of risk um, and the environment that I grew up in. Um, mm-hmm. I'm I tend to be quite a risk averse person, quite a probably you know boring person as well. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you're really selling yourself here Raymond um, you probably most members would probably tell from the supply network uh, piece um, <laughs> but don't worry we'll get to that yeah um, yeah I yeah I think um, yeah it does reflect my personality um, well I wouldn't call it boring you're not a boring person at all um, but that there is that conservative element to you. And and, and something yeah. else that I think I picked up on was when you said that 
you know, you started off in this micro micro cap area, mm. but then you migrated towards large caps, which is mm. kind of a, a risk averse thing to do in general. Mm. So would that be why you, what was it that, that brought your focus more towards bigger companies, more established companies and some things that were small and a bit more risky? Yeah, I think the main reasons why I was drawn to the small cap space was, I think, first, um, smaller the business, the easier it is to understand. Mm -hmm. And I think I was exposed to a lot of investing newsletters and the fund managers that I was following and the books I read. They often emphasized how you can outperform the market by investing in smaller companies. Mm -hmm. Um, And over time, I've realized, I think reading quality investing was probably the tipping point for me um when i transitioned away from the smaller companies to the bigger and higher quality companies um and really appreciated the um the strength and dominance of incumbent companies and how hard it is to um just displace and disrupt those companies yeah what what kind of companies you attracted to then in that sense when you think about high quality companies what what kind of businesses would be towards the top of your list um, I think a lot of them would be the companies that are very expensive at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think that's just the nature of the ASX market because there's mm. very few of them. Um, but when you think of quality names, yeah, a lot of them are, are global. Um, you have, you know, Nike that's got a strong brand. You've got Apple, um, mm. amazing um brand that you know, started from hardware and now it's making its way into, um, you know, software services. and services, services. Yeah. Um, and what about in Australia? Uh, I think of, yeah, um, PWR Holdings is, it's one company that's really devoted a lot of time and effort and, mm-hmm. and we really should just ch- explain to members what that company does. It's a Gold Coast based company, which, and it's not your typical Gold Coast based company. We should make that plain. It's not a property developer. Um, they make radiators for F1 cars and cooling systems, we should call them, hmm. uh, run by a uh, one of the most iconoclastic CEOs in Australia, I think. Uh, Keith, what's his surname? Keith Will. Keith Will, incredible name. Yeah. Who's quoted as saying, I eat sleep and like, shit radiators yeah. <laughs> yeah. i love that quote first review yeah and and it's a it sounds like a very good description of his life mm. um and the kind of business that he's built so if you speak to any value investor about their most favorite businesses in australia pwr is often on that list mm. you often hear that's spoken about just it's always been just so expensive uh, mm. really had the opportunity to purchase it Mm. But I just love that the founder-led management teams mm. that just started making things out of passion and, and interest. Uh, I don't think they had any interest in becoming the, um, you know, the most profitable company in the world. But I think that's just been a byproduct of um, their effort, you know, energy. If you want to sell something for a large amount of money and that's your starting point, I think that's a really, really bad place to be, not just for a founder, but for an investor too. Mm. Uh, the motivations are wrong. If you if you want to make a lot of money, you really need to do something exceptionally well. Mm. And you need to be thinking about that from the customer's point of view and take on that challenge. And then if you do well, then maybe the money comes, then maybe the, the money follows after that. But if you just set out to make a lot of money, Mm. that kind of opportunism doesn't really align with the kind of founders that I think we want to invest with. So Mm. I'd agree with that. You you want Mm. people who are actually dedicated to the task. I think we saw that on Monday with the, with the, the brewer at the brewery, you Mm. know, absolutely passionate guy loves beer. Uh, It's got a long history in it and is well known for his reputation. And that's the kind of founder you want. Not somebody who's thinking about the money. Somebody who's thinking about the product. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it kind of makes me think about how the educational system or especially the environment that I grew up in where people chose degrees, um, purely based on, um, you know, climbing the corporate ladder and trying to 
um, make the most money. Yeah. You're kind of drawn to those jobs yeah. um, to justify your your um, UAI score. Well, that's I think it's UMAT score now. Uh, don't ask me. <laughs> uh, I definitely haven't got one. Yeah, I so think that's know, the wrong way. What it was. I think it's the wrong way to choose your profession <laughs> over um, the long term. Well, for me, I mean, some people are satisfied by that, I'm sure. And mm. we do need people to fill, you know, corporate seats. <laughs> we need mm. bums on seats in big corporations. But if you're looking for uh, investment opportunities, I think that, especially in the smaller areas, in the smaller cap stocks, you 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 need to see and feel the enthusiasm of founder and for the niche that they operate in and, and, and their desire to make this their life's work. You know, mm. and, and that's that's what often makes for a much, much better investing opportunity than somebody who's just smart and mm. is using using the business as a way of just generating wealth. So mm. um which is why we go onto people's Instagrams and try and see what car they drive and look through their mm. how they talk about themselves. If they're not if they're talking about, you know, what they own or what they've been on holiday and going to Aspen and stuff like that, all of that I could find is is absolutely secondary and should be dis- disregarded, if not marked against. Um, you want to feel that passion about the product that they're making and and um, the enthusiasm they have for, for for building a business over a lifetime. They're the ideal founders for me. Hmm. It seems like you had a similar mindset when you started out that intelligent investor. Yeah, but life has worn me down, Raymond. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, we should tell members that Raymond did ask to ask me a few questions on the way through, and I thought that that sounds good. I didn't. I don't know what questions he's going to ask me, so I'll reserve judgment. <laughs> but yeah, I did. I, I was very passionate about, like you, I always love businesses, um, and I, whenever I read about finance, I just realised I didn't understand half of it, and I had a friend, and a. My, subsequently my business partner Robert Carey he worked at Huntley's and doing you, Your Money Weekly which was a a tip sheet kind of newsletter uh, but with a value based approach I think and it was just impenetrable to me uh, I just couldn't understand how ordinary people were meant to understand this so I would read it every week uh, and I just thought we could do better than that. I worked in advertising as a copywriter at the time. So Robert was going to take care of the research and I was going to do the marketing and the, the words and the editing, uh, which probably brings us around to uh, the process that you're going through at the moment. So I thought it would be interesting for members to understand what happens when we bring on a new analyst and the kind of agonizing steps that you have to go through to sort of climb not necessarily the ranks internally in terms of job titles but climb the ladder towards being not just a better analyst but a better communicator because that is what drove me I suppose when I set the business up I wanted to bring a journalistic narrative based telling of business stories so obviously you want the the analysis to be reliable profitable over the long term and come from that value perspective but we we don't want it to be boring you know we want to actually excite people about these businesses maybe try and educate them even if they're not going to buy the stock and tell stories in a way that means that if you're going to do 1200 words people actually feel as though it's not a burden to read they look forward to reading it and it's kind of difficult because the finance industry operates in exactly the opposite direction. I think the fi- most finance businesses have got a vested interest in making people feel confused and perplexed and stupid. And we've tried to do the opposite. But in order to do that, we have to we we've had to develop a kind of induction process that is almost like going to a, a you know a communist reprogramming camp. Because most people who have grown up through finance become absolutely immune to the jargon and the acronyms and the, the the stupid sort of cliches that they constantly regurgitate. So let's just take a break and then we'll get back into the process you're in at the moment, Raymond, and all the red lines I've been putting through your copy. <laughs> See you in a minute. 
If you enjoy our approach to investing but don't want to manage your own money, check out Intelligent Investors' range of managed funds, including income, growth, ethical, and international options. Decades of research and experience is distilled into the management of these four managed funds, each focused on achieving outsized investment returns. Check out our performance, track record, fees, and approach at intelligentinvestor.com.au forward slash funds hyphen overview. That's intelligentinvestor.com.au forward slash funds hyphen overview. Welcome back, everybody. We're at the third part of our discussion with Raymond Jang, our new analyst, and we're just about to get into talking about the process that new analysts follow when they join us, uh, which I've been through many, many times, and Raymond is going through it now. So let's start there, Raymond. You, you've written your first story, which I think was Supply Network. Interesting business. Tell us, tell us from your point of view what that process was like, where you started and how we worked you through the process of investigating the company towards publishing a story on that business. Yeah, I think fortunately I was quite familiar with Supply Network mm -hmm. at the start. So I had carried out uh, comprehensive research into the business, but really wanted to uh, gain more conviction and provide additional insights for members. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't just supply network. You also did a fair bit of work on the competitive environment. And we should, we should really discuss that because there are three companies that supply truck parts and bus parts in yeah, Australia. Yeah. And this is what supply network does. You came up with a nice idea, I thought, to start the story off, which was to compare its share price returns over the previous decade with decade with Apple and Google, mm. <laughs> completely different businesses. But the, the return of supply network has been slightly less than Apple and slightly more than Google or Alphabet over the past 10 years. Mm. It's kind of mind blowing that a company that sells truck parts can do mm. that. Mm. So your investigation began with a look at the competitive environment. So tell us a bit about the, the three companies in that area and what you learned about that business through doing that comparison. Yeah, it was going through the two other competitors being Maxi Parts. Uh, Maxi Parts was historically known as Maxi Trans. Yeah. And they were focused on manufacturing trailers alongside distributing aftermarket truck parts as well. Mm -hmm. And then you have Batcore, which is your um, auto barn. Um, so they do retail as yeah. well as um, aftermarket. So not directly, parts. not directly comparable, but there's yeah. elements of that business, which we've recommended in the past um, that overlap with supply. Yeah. So going to the financials of both companies, I noticed that supply network had a much higher return on assets and as a return on capital compared to Maxi Parts and um, Bapcor. And I found that really interesting. And when you dig deeper into that, um, you, you want to find the answers to a lot of questions as to what is driving that higher return on capital? And I noticed Supply Network also had um, higher margins than Maxi Parts. Mm -hmm. And that got me thinking, okay, um, they're essentially distributing the same types of parts. Right. Um, but what's... Almost a commodity product. Yeah, exactly. And Maxi Parts has more stores um than supply network but somehow supply network's been able to generate more revenue per per site mm. and i initially thought ah uh, from reading uh, management's annual reports they did comment on um uh, on the fact that they do get a lot of corporate fleet customers so think of toll group 
mm-hmm. that have massive fleet of trucks and they have contracts with um, these aftermarket distributors. Um, so I, I initially thought that was the reason why supply network um, had a had higher returns, um, yeah. mainly because of uh, a higher concentration of corporate customers. Right. Um, and and when... that being, and would you just make the point that the reason why parts are important to trucks is trucks are kind of like aircraft. They're expensive to buy. And if they're not moving, they're costing you a lot of money to stand still. So if you're reliant, <coughs> excuse me, if you're reliant on a part for a truck, um, the person who can get it to you quickest is likely to be able to charge higher margins because as soon as you get that part fitted, you can get the truck back on the road and it can start earning again. So that's what we presumed that these companies were prepared to pay higher margins, but it didn't kind of work out like that, did it? No. So tell, tell us what happened. Tell us what happened next. So I decided to give a call to a lot of um, the repairers across Australia just mm-hmm. to understand, you know, who's on the top of their list when they have an urgent repair that they need to undertake. And yeah. Yeah, most of them would be like, say, multi-spheres um, straight off the bat. Um, if you're looking for a recommendation on um, an aftermarket uh, parts supplier. Um, so just that natural um, answer to a question just speaks volumes of um, the reputation or yeah. uh, of supply network. Um, mm-hmm. Multispares being the name of the, the actual franchise uh, business. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, that's when I realized that I got it the other way around. Um, they're actually their competitive advantage lies in um, providing a very mission critical part for the smaller uh, players. Yeah. Um, so when, when I received the first draft of your story, so we, mm. we, <clears throat> we speak about the structure to the article. So after you've done your research, then we kind of drill down into what the business really does and what it is that the, is the thing that members really need to understand a business in in order to grasp it, in order to get their head around it. And we thought we'd found it with that, you know, that reputation for, so, but it wasn't, it wasn't quite that. Um, because I, I know when I got that first draft, I still didn't really get it. Hmm. Well, they haven't got the biggest number of outlets and yet they're getting these, this good feedback that you discovered from making your calls. But if you haven't got the most number of outlets, why have you got that best reputation? Because mm. you'd think that the outlets are going to, the number of outlets, the proximity to the customer is going to determine the speed that you can get that product to them. And it was at that point that I was saying, well, if I don't really get this, then I don't think members are going to get it. And I don't think you've got it. We need to find out what this is. So what did you do to find out what that really was? just to challenge your own assumptions about why they were making the margins they were making. Yeah. I really wanted to put myself in the customer's shoes. And so I pretended to be a customer submitted an inquiry to um, the, the business based in Tamil boy, um, mm. which is actually their um, corporate head office as well, but Where's they that? Is do, that Western Sydney. Yeah. That's um, it's like a 40, 45 minute uh, drive out to the West mm-hmm. and yeah, so when I submitted my inquiry, I was quite interested to explore uh, more about the business and get a site to her as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and funnily enough, um, the CEO actually um, gets back to me um, the next morning, which was a remarkably quick turnaround. So did you say you are a customer or did you say you were an analyst researching the company? Uh, oh, yes, that's right. I was using the customer inquiry, but I was saying okay. that I was an analyst, yeah, right, uh, right. to clarify. Okay, um, so he got back to you by email. Yeah, yeah, and then he said, I think his first line was, you would have got a quicker response if you had actually asked about truck truck parts. Right, <laughs> so that, that's pretty good, right? That's that's what you want to hear, that tells yeah. you something. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing you're never going to get from an annual report. That's the... 
that is really sort of burning the shoe leather is is what gives you that kind of insight insight so tell tell us what happened after that yeah i'm always wary of you know finding um things to support your initial thesis like confirmation mm -hmm. bias but mm -hmm. um i think we shouldn't downplay um management's attitude um and how they interact with customers and how close they are with customers because um just arranging a meeting with them and a site tour was pretty uh, seamless and um he was quite energetic about meeting me and take me taking me around to uh, really explore um the business mm -hmm. um yeah just getting to the to the site um you could tell he um was very very plainly spoken and very reserved and um very knowledgeable about truck parts and that's that's really what he wanted to talk about um, the industry and the business yeah. So that's some somebody who's excited about what they're doing, even though they've been doing it for well over a decade. Yeah, two, um, two decades. Yeah, definitely. Um, he actually told me, "Yeah, look out the window," and the window was facing towards the the main road. And he's like, um, "You know, out on that road, there's probably like five to ten trucks per minute that crosses these roads, and majority of them um, use multi spares uh, for right. their parts." So um yeah that was it <laughs> okay all right so so let's let's talk about time's running out so let's just talk about the process when you gathered that information tell us how you felt when we first edited your story so this is kind of the the deprogramming camp that we have to go into how, how did it feel when we went through the story and i kind of i think you probably had three attempts at, at getting it right um, yeah <clears throat> Yeah. How was that? Yeah, just distilling all my research and trying to simplify my understanding of what was really the underlying reasons for supply networks um mm. superior performance was and this is a classic problem that we face with new analysts, Raymond. And, yeah. and we should talk about it with members because if you do your research well, you'll have and you did your research well you you will have hundreds of things in your head that your brain hasn't necessarily weighted according to their importance mm. you know and and part of the problem with communicating a complicated story and i think every business is kind of complicated so when you when you approach it from a research perspective but from a narrative perspective there are probably only two or three things that you really need to know and the numbers after that are just a result of those two or three things about what a business is really doing. Mm -hmm. And and we found out what those things were. And from my point of view, that process of getting you to weight all of these different factors and, and, and really communicating what was the most important things that members need to know about this business and then giving them the financial overview and the competitive environment is kind of secondary to that. So the focus really was on you really understanding what the two or three most important drivers in this business and building your story about that. But it, did you find it a demoralizing process because you're putting all of this work into the first draft and I send it back with a load of red lines through it. We have a conversation and that happens two or three times. How did you feel at the end of it? Did you feel as though this is going to be like the most frustrating part of the process or did you feel as though there, this this was something that you really had to learn and it helped you distill your thinking i actually thought it was quite powerful um mm. like the process itself was challenging um and it required a lot of hard work especially when you're trying to you're spending time and revising your uh thinking but i think it's it's necessary mm -hmm. um it's a bit like trying to achieve a certain you know running time or you know get to a certain um goal like yeah. you just you just need to put in the hard yards and then right then you realize the the benefits of um actually going through the process rather than mm -hmm. purely focusing on the outcome 
That's right. That's right. Um, it's repetition. Like so many things in life, the more stories you do, the better at it you'll get. And just to reassure you, there will be a moment, some point in the next six months or so, I'd say, where the penny will kind of drop and you won't need to sort of have me as closely involved as I have been in helping you develop your, your articles. Um, but you're only going to get there by repeating what we've learned first time around again and again and again. And that is part of the deprogramming. Mm. You know, like if you sat there and read a load of our annual reports, if you've, if you've had your head buried in, in broker reports, if you've been reading the financial review, I mean, it, it doesn't matter where this stuff comes from. It all suffers from the same kind of jargon, the same approach. Um, and we just sort of drink that in and it's kind of hard to let go of it. So part of the process is learning to let go of the mm. language that the industry uses in order to make it more accessible and relevant and hopefully more interesting to our audience. The best thing about what we do is that the finance industry is terrible at communication. You don't have to be brilliant, right? You've just not got to, if you can just not use jargon, if you can avoid cliches, and if you can structure your story that gets to the heart of why this is a good or a bad investment, you'll be in the top 2% of communicators in this industry. You don't have to be brilliant. You just have to not do things that everybody else does. Mm. That's the first step for you. The next step after that will be where, say, I am at or Gaurav or, or <clears throat> you know, Graham's at or Nathan, where we've been here a long time and it just becomes kind of second nature. Um, that's when it becomes more fun. I think you can develop your own voice. I don't know if you've ever been in a band, but, you know, every band when they start sounds like somebody else. Yeah. And you have to start, you have to start there. You can hear the influences in every band's first first album. But by the time you get to the third, they become more confident in their own style and they develop their own voice. And you know it's clearly them. And then the next thing that happens is other bands start copying them or are influenced mm -hmm. by them. And you can hear that. So that's that's where we want you to be ultimately. It'll take a bit of a while to get there, but but um you've made a really good start. Yeah. Thank you, John. What are you, what are you <laughs> working on next, Raymond? Um, yeah, I'm currently looking into a big retailer that everyone um, is probably aware of and probably shops at. Come on in, um, hear it. Let's hear it. It's uh, JB Hi-Fi. The result <laughs> came out yesterday, I think. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's quite a resilient result. Um, mm -hmm. But JB Hi-Fi, I was actually looking at the share price chart over the last 20 years. Um, and when you think of all the big brands that it sells, mm. it's actually absolutely smoked um nearly every single brand yeah um you think of samsung um electrolux bosch mm -hmm. it's they've they've underperformed the index most of them uh, yeah. whereas jb hi-fi has recorded a 20 percent compounded annual growth rate return not um, bad not bad yeah. <laughs> so what do you let's just have a Let's finish off with a quick chat about JB Hi-Fi then before the research yeah. and try and relate it back to supply supply network. What is it? Because JB Hi-Fi is not, like it's in a very competitive field hmm. and yet they've done better than everybody else. What is it about what they're doing that allows them to be better than everybody else, do you think? Yeah, when I first looked at it, I actually had a um, very negative perception of JB Hi-Fi. Mm. Um, it looks it, like a terrible business from the outside, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I was like, it's, it's a super competitive environment. It's retail. It's, it's just selling technology. Um, that you can buy but, anywhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but when you actually look at Australia's um, demographics and the physical environment, there's actually not too many players in that space. Mm -hmm. um, and JB Hi-Fi is actually quite different to any of the other. In what way? Um, in the way they present themselves, mm -hmm. um, the employees, the way they dress and how casual they are, mm -hmm. but also exceptionally uh, knowledgeable about their products. Yeah. And when I thought even like thought about 
my purchases of electronic products, I actually ended up buying most of my stuff at JB Hi-Fi without really realizing. <laughs> yeah. To me, I mean, I don't want to preempt the research. We've we've all internally been talking a lot about JB Hi-Fi over the past six months, I think. Uh, we haven't published any research on it, but it, it is it is a fascinating business. Mm. And I was last in there uh, just getting a power pack, <coughs> excuse me, last week. And I would see it as kind of the reverse Harvey Norman. You know, you look at Harvey Norman and you look at their advertising and it's kind of really discount orientated. It's shouty and price led. And you go in there and it's not like that at all. Um, so the, the, there's a kind of weird misalignment I feel between Harvey Norman's brand positioning and the in-store experience. Whereas JB Hi-Fi to me gets that exa exactly the other way around. It, it looks, it's very, very discount driven. But when you go in there, most of the salespeople are kind of enthusiasts and experienced mm. in their product range. Um, I was in there last week talking to a, uh, to a filmmaker about video cameras and just really, really new stuff. Uh, it's kind of the opposite of Harvey Norman. But look, I think we're going to have to finish there, Raymond. Um, we don't want to pre preempt your research. It could be a few weeks away yet because I think this is going to be a very interesting, in some ways, demanding story to write. It's kind of like supply networks. You, it's, you really, really need to find what it is that they are doing differently that in a reasonably competitive environment, they're excelling when others are struggling. It's not immediately obvious what it is, but, but um, members will know more about that when we get to it in a couple of weeks. Raymond, I know you haven't asked me very many questions. We might save that for another decade. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks a lot for um, being really open about your background and your history. Um, I hope members have enjoyed it. And um, you've made a great start. We're looking forward to working with you. As you know, it's a kind of a supportive environment here. We hope it is anyway. And um, any time that you need any assistance, you need some guidance, there's plenty of people there willing to give you a hand. So uh, you're in good hands. Really appreciate it, John. And yeah, thoroughly enjoying my start to my II journey. Um, That's right. So well, it, thanks it, for it that. Did start, start at a brewery, which is always a good place to start your <laughs> career. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Raymond. Thanks, John.